All right, so welcome to lecture one, everybody. Um, I probably haven't had the pleasure of having you, and if I have, welcome back. If I haven't, my name is Keegan Gold, and I am going to be teaching you basic chemistry. So um, basic chemistry is not base as in um, easy, like basic as in easy, it's base as in foundation. So this is a foundational chemistry that's going to help you grow and help you succeed better in Gen Chem 1. In fact, we've proven it through the years that you'll do much better in Gen Chem 1 if you have a strong foundation through basic chemistry. So uh, our first lecture is actually going to start in chapter 2. So this is actually going to be chapter 2, part 1 lecture. I'll, I'll post part 2 lecture in the next um, week most likely. So this is going to cover um, about the first half of chapter two. Keep in mind that chapter one I want you to read on your own and have a general understanding on your own. That's because it's easy to read that stuff I think and it comes off better reading. But this is a lot of calculation based stuff, some conceptual things, so I really want to make sure you have a strong foundation in chapter two before moving on. All right, so without further ado, let's talk about the difference between accuracy and precision. So let's say you're out and you want to shoot Frankenstein. I don't know why you want to fr shoot Frankenstein, but let's see. See have those things in his neck like that. Okay, so here's Frankenstein. I'm obviously not an artist, and why is he smiling? I don't know. Let's make it an evil smile. <laughs> okay, so you want to shoot Frankenstein. Now, to kill Frankenstein, you actually need to shoot him in the heart, which is right here. Okay, um, so let's say you pull, draw your bow and arrow, because you're going to shoot him with a bow and arrow. You're a good archer, way to go. And you draw your arrow back and you release it in. It shoots him right here, right where you're going for. That would be accurate. So accuracy is how close you are to the actual value or measurement. So it's how close you are to the actual value or measurement. Now this is actually quite different from precision. So an example of precision might be, let's say you go to shoot him and you miss, you hit over here, then you shoot again, you hit over here, and then you shoot again, you hit right here. Now all of these values are very close to each other, but you're off target, right? You're not shooting exactly where you want to be. That would be precision. Precision is how close your measurements are to each other. So accuracy, you're accurate if you hit right where you're going. Precision is you hit all close to each other, but they're far away. So why is it important to pay attention to precision? Well, if I keep shooting up and to the left, I can correct my shot, right? I can shoot more towards the center and I can shoot down. And if I shoot more towards the center and down, I'll probably hit my, my shot and what I'm going for. So it can be corrected, right? The air that I was experiencing can be corrected. And that air is called systematic air because it's, there's a system to it. I'm, I'm systematically hitting the wrong way. So systematic air, it's fixable air. It's what happens when you have precision, but no accuracy. Now, of course, we can have situations where we have no preci neither precision nor accuracy. So, for example, if, if I shoot one shot right here, one shot over here, and one shot over here, neither of those shots were close to each other. So they're neither accurate nor, preci nor precise. And there's really no system to it, right? That I could correct all of them by moving one particular way. And so this would be called random error. And I should have written error under systematic, sorry. Random error is simply that. It can't be fixed. It 
it's random. So a few examples of times that this occurs. So let's say you hop on the scale. So let's say you go to hop on the scale and it says you weigh 170.2 pounds. And you in fact weigh 170.2 pounds. So this would be accurate. Woohoo! Now let's say you hop on the scale and you do it a few times. One time you weigh 165.4, another time you weigh 165.3, another time you weigh 165.0. Now, all of these are relatively close to each other. They're all about 165, so that we would call these precise. But are they accurate, keeping in mind you actually weigh 170.2? No, they're not. So this is a systematic error that's occurring, and you know that you can fix it by simply adding roughly five pounds. So if you add roughly five pounds to your measurement each time, then you get closer to the accurate value. And that's what we mean by paying attention to systematic error versus random error. In this situation, I can fix it by adding the five pounds. All right. Now let's move on and talk about scientific notation. So scientific notation is essentially a way of representing very big numbers. Let me give you a uh, a few examples before before we begin. So there are in a mole, and we'll get to discuss a mole, there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd things in a mole. And this number right here might look harmless enough, but that 10 to the 23rd holds a lot of power. In fact, 10 to the 23rd is a one with 23 zeros. That's how these exponents work. So it's a 1 with 23 zeros. So if I multiply 6.022 times a 1 with 23 zeros, what I get is 6022567891011121415161718192020. So I get this number. And I don't think you want to write this number every time we use a mole. It is far easier to write this number the more condensed form. Also, when you have numbers like this written in scientific notation, for example, if I had 4.2 times 10 to the 8th, 5.1 times 10 to the 6th, and 7.3 times 10 to the 4, normally we look at numbers and we'd say that 7.3 is bigger. But now that we know that we're multiplying them by times 1, with the respective number of zeros written up here. So this would be 4.2 times 10 to the 8 would be 4.2 times a 1 with 8 zeros versus 5.1 times a 1 with 6 zeros versus 7.3 times a 1 with 4 zeros. You can do these in your calculator or you can just kind of imagine if you have a bank account, one has 1 with 8 zeros, one has a 1 with 6 zeros, and one has a 1 with 4 zeros. This one has more money in it. So this one is a larger number. And you didn't even need to look at these. You just said, what's bigger, eight, six, or four? This one, that's bigger, that's larger, check. So these are two different ways that we use uh, scientific notation. Okay, so now I have a better idea of how scientific notation works. Let's go ahead and, or why we use it anyways, let's go ahead and do a few examples to make sure that we know how it works. So if I have a number, for example, that's 4,722, 4,722 I should say, and we want to put this in scientific notation. Here are the rules. First, we place a decimal. Even if there is no decimal there, you imagine that there's a decimal there. You put it where it ought to be. Then you're going to move that decimal between the first and second number, not before, not with zeros, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but between the first and second non-zero number. So I move this I gotta move it one, two, three times. You count the spaces as you move. One, two, three. So we just moved it um, three times, or in other words, to a power of three. So when we put this in scientific notation, this would be 4.722 times 10 to the third. 
Now, as chemists, we always want to prove this to ourselves. So we're never done with the problem until we say, hey, does that answer actually make sense? So we want to take this number and now ask, does it make sense? Well, we know that this is 4.722 times 10 to the third, but we know 10 to the third is a one with three zeros. So our question is, is 4.722 times a one with three zeros, in other words, a thousand, equal to 4,722? And if you enter in your calculator and just look at it, the answer is yes. Yes, it is. Woohoo! Good job. So you should always be able to get back the number that you started with and be able to go back and forth between them. Scientific notation is just another way to write a number. It's not, let me repeat that, scientific notation is just another way to write a number. You shouldn't lose any information in scientific notation. All right, let's do another example here. Let's say you have... And this, we're all talking about magnitude greater than one, and we'll talk why. Uh, I'm more about that here in a little bit. Let's do another number. 50,624. 50,624, and I want to put this in scientific notation. So again, you imagine a decimal. You move it one, two, three, four times. So this would be 5.0624. Let me do that again. One, two, three, four times. I'll label them. 5.0624 times 10 to the 4. Again, you want to ask yourself, does that answer make sense? Well, if we take 5.0624 and multiply it by a 1 with four zeros, in other words, 10,000, we will in fact get 50,624. Woohoo! Good job. So we should get our answer back. Now, if we move to numbers that have... Um, magnitudes between 0 and 1. And let me explain why we use magnitudes, actually. If this had been negative 50,624, my answer would have been negative 5.0624. So I want, I'm talking about when the magnitude is greater than 1 for the number that you're going to turn into scientific notation, you just want to make sure um, that you're using this format. Numbers with magnitude between 0 and 1, in other words, decimal points. So if we have something that's like 0 0.0, two, six, four, and we want to put that in scientific notation, you follow the same process. You want to take this decimal and you want to move it between the first and the second non-zero number. One, two. So I move it two times. In other words, this is 2.64. But if I put 2.64 times 10 to the two, I would get 264, right? Because a 10 to the two is a one with two zeros. So 2.64 times 100 would be 264. That's not what I want to do. I moved it this way, so now I want this to be a negative 2, 10 to the negative 2. By the way, that equals 1 divided by 10 to the 2. In other words, 1 over 100. Another way to look at this is you're just saying 2.64, and I'll, I'll break it down a little better, times 1 over 10 to the 2, because that's what 10 to the negative 2 means which would be 2.64 divided by 10 to the 2, which would be 2.64 divided by 100. Is 2.64 divided by 100 0.0264? It sure is. So this is a lot of work just to kind of go back and show you how it works. But you should always be asking yourself, if you're using a next negative exponent, the number that you're representing must be smaller than this. In other words, we must be representing a decimal. So anytime we use a negative exponent, we better be looking at a decimal. Oftentimes, it's, that gets confused with like a negative number. So if you have negative 0 0.000571, for example, and we want to represent this in scientific notation, well, we'd simply move the decimal place one, two, three, four times to be between the first and the second number. It has to be between the first and the second number. In other words, we have negative 5.71 times 10 to the negative again, 1, 2, 3, 4. You can check it out. You can say, okay, does that equal negative 5.71 divided by 10 to the 4? In other words, does it equal negative 5.71 divided by 10,000 or one with four zeros? And the answer is yes, yes, it does. So you can put it in your calculator, figure it out, but you should always be able to go back and forth. So these are my 
numbers in scientific notation. You never want to be able to lose information going from here to here. You should always be able to go back as well. All right, moving on. Now we get to significant figures. So let's go back to my scale where I said, okay, you weigh 170.2 pounds. How accurate is that scale? Like how much does that scale know? For example, are you exactly 170.2000000 down to the mass of an atom? Does it know that accurately? Is it is it sure that you're in the nose infinitely how much you weigh? So let me ask you this. Is that exactly how much you weigh? Or can you imagine that maybe you weigh 170.21 pounds and it rounded it to 170.2? Or what if you weighed 170.19 pounds and it rounded it? Well, this is what significant figures do. They tell us exactly how much information we do know from a measurement. In this case, we knew here. In fact, this was actually a guess. So let me explain what I mean by that. If we had let's say three beakers for now and one is labeled between zero and ten liters and I filled it right there how much would you say is in there you probably are naturally guessing it's about three you might have said four some of you might have said two but most of you probably said it was about three liters all right, so that's good. What if I keep that same measurement? Zero, 10. This time I go one, two, three. Now you're looking at it and you're like, hey, it's three, but maybe it's a, it's a little more than three. So maybe now you're guessing it's actually like 3.1. Did you notice that by adding these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, etc. by adding these numbers, suddenly you're guessing an additional amount. Now, if I continue on with that pattern, so it's gonna get a little bit busy here. Actually, let's make it a little better over here. Let's say we have the exact same beaker and we go zero, one, two, three, four, and then I put graduation markets between there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's hard to see, but this is somewhere between 3.1 and 3.2. You might say that this is actually 3.15 or 3.14 or something to that effect. Now, every time I add additional information, you're guessing one extra decimal place, right? And that's why I said this last number was actually a guess. The last number of a measurement is actually your best guess. And so the real range here, when I said some of you guessed two and some of you might be guessing four, the real range is between plus or minus one of your guess. So my guess here was three. If I take three and I subtract one, I get two. If I take three and I add one, I get four. My real range is actually between two and four. You don't know that it's three. You just know it's somewhere between two and four. Let's look at this one. I got 3.1. Now, I don't know that it's exactly 3.1, but I know it was somewhere between 3.0 to 3.2. In other words, I took this last number, I added one of that place, and I subtracted one of that place, and that gave me my range. Let's go over here. 3.15. This is my last number. This is my guess. Add one to five, subtract one from five. 3.14 to 3.16 is my range. So as we add graduation, we get a more and more narrow um, gap. So if your life depends on it and it's a life-saving medicine and it has to be very accurate, you're going to want something with a lot of graduation marks. Graduation meaning those marks that we added. You're gonna want something with a lot of those graduation marks because that will give you the most narrow gap and that will give you the most precise, or I should specifically say accurate value. All right, so now that we kind of have an idea, let's go back to the scale. 
How much did your scale really know about you? Well, remember, none of this was presented. We were only told it was 170.2. That's telling us it's actually a range. We take that two, it's our last number, we add one and subtract one, so we're talking about somewhere between one and three. In other words, our range was 170.1 to 170.3. So this was actually our weight. All right, now we're looking at the rules for significant figures. So it helps to understand um, how the rules work and what significant figures, how many significant figures something has, because that will t give us a better idea of how to guess. So first, all non-zero numbers are significant. So 4,725, this would have four sig figs. Um, 56,724. That would have one, two, three, four, five sig figs. This had four because it had four non zero numbers. This had five because it had five non zero numbers. All zeros between numbers are significant. So an example would be let's say 402.5. You look at that zero and you say, hey, is it between those two numbers? It sure is. It's significant. This has four sig figs. Do another example. Let's say you have 500.07. All of these zeros are between two numbers, two non-zero numbers, and therefore we know that they're significant. So we got one, two, three, four, five. This would have five significant figures. Zeros before numbers are not significant. They're like placeholders. So for example, uh, 0 0.00745. The real meat and potatoes of this number are the 7, 4, and the 5. The zeros are placeholders. They, they're important, but they are not significant figures. And so this only has three significant figures, the 7, the 4, and the 5. Let me show you why that's important for scientific notation. If I were to take this number and put it in scientific notation, we would only write 7.45 times 10 to the negative third. And so understanding that these zeros though, although they're important, you don't end up writing them in scientific notation and that's a really quick way to determine whether or not they're significant. All right, let's see. You might, I, don't, I can't imagine that you do, but if you put zero, 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 zero into your calculator a whole bunch and then put the number like 425, even though you put a ton of zeros, you really only end up with three numbers that are significant. All right, zeros with, or zeros after numbers with a decimal point. Somewhere in that number are significant. Let me give you a few examples. Let's see, let's say 425.0. Here we have a zero. This comes somewhere after a number. It doesn't matter if it comes after a decimal, just anywhere in that number, if it comes after a non-zero number, is there a decimal somewhere in that number? Yes. So this has four sig figs. Let me repeat that again, because that was horribly worded. Does a zero come after a number? Yeah, it came after the four, the two, and the five. Is there a decimal in that number? Yes, there is. And therefore, it would have four sig figs. Now let's look at another number. Um, 52.400. Fifty-two point four zero zero. This has one, two, three, four, five significant figures because each of these zeros come after a number, and there is a decimal in there. What about one hundred point zero? One hundred point zero. These zeros all come after the number one, and there is a decimal somewhere in that number. Therefore, they are significant. This has four. Let me give you a counterexample the number 100. Do these zeros come after a number? Yeah. Is there a decimal in that number? No. These are therefore not significant. And this only has one sig fig. Let me break that down in terms of ranges that we discussed up here. If I had, for example, the number 4,000, this only has one significant figure because there's no decimal in there. This is, in other words, is a range between 3,000 
and 5,000 because this is the only number that we know. So we add one, we subtract one, and we take the range between those values. So understanding this stuff is very important as opposed to the following. What if we did 4,000 and added a decimal? Suddenly, now we've added a decimal, we have one, two, three, four significant figures because these zeros all come after a number and there is a decimal in that number. So this says four sig figs. The range, therefore, would be between the last, we'd be looking at the last number. The last number is in the ones place. We add one, we subtract one from 4,000. In other words, we have an answer of 3,999 to 4,001. There's a huge difference between 4,000 and 4,000 decimal point. Okay. One more thing just to really drive this point home. Sorry, the only paper I could find is my kids' drawings. Look, they drew a U and an H. Pretty good. And a V? Wow, what they spell? I have no idea. But they're really cute. Okay. So, so we said, okay, we've got 4,000. And we said, oh, that has one sig fig. Let's go ahead and put that in scientific notation. And we'll also talk about its range. So the number 4,000, sorry, the number 4,000 in scientific notation, pull this up a little bit. What do we write? Four times 10 to the third, because we'd only include the one number that's significant. So therefore, our scientific notation should only have one sig fig. And the range, again, for this, we took um, the only known sig fig right here, we added one as we subtracted one, so three to five, and we decided that our range was 3,000 to 5,000. Then we hopped down here, I'm gonna take some space here, and we said, all right, we got 4,000 point. 4,000 point, it had four significant figures we determined, because these zeros are significant. In scientific notation, I would therefore write this number as 4.000 times 10 to the third. And my range for this, again, this if this is my last number, I add one and subtract one, I'm looking at 3,999 to 4,001 as my range. Now, if I look at anything in between here, what if, for example, I wanted to write 4,000 with two sig figs or 4,000 with three sig figs? That's where our current system fails us. We have no idea how to write that. Like I could write 4,000 and I could say, hey, I want it to have two sig figs, but there's no way to represent that. That's where scientific notation, again, is stronger for us as scientists to understand. So for example, if I wanted to write 4,000 with two sig figs, I'd write it as 4.0 times 10 to the third. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us we know up to this place, the hundredths place. So if we know up to the hundredths place, we could add 100 and subtract 100, and our range would be, uh, th sorry, 3,900 to 4,100. Subtracting 100 and adding 100. What if we want to represent it with three sig figs? Then we're looking at the tenths place here. If we add 10 and subtract 10, we get a range of 3,990 to 4,010, and we would write that as 4.00 times 10 to the third. So scientific notation is really important because it narrows our range. It helps us to get a better idea. So the more zeros you have in scientific notation, the more narrow the range is, the better we know that measurement, um, the more information we know about that measurement. All right. So let's move on to some examples. How many sig figs are in the following? We're going to go through this relatively quickly. 14,000. Uh, 568 would have one, two, three, four, five. Just for funsies, let's go ahead and put these in scientific notation. You should um, be able to do that with all of these as well. This would be 1.4568 times 10 to the fourth. Next, we have 14.0512. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six sig figs. And this would be 1.40512 times 10 to the one. Next, we have this number. Remember, zeros before des or before numbers are never significant. So our answer here is one. The, our answer for significant figures is five. In scientific notation, it's one point four five one two 
times 10 to the negative third. On this one, it has one, two, three, four. Remember, these numbers come after a number and there's a decimal, five, six, seven. So this has seven significant figures. And I'd put it in scientific notation as 1.452000 times 10 to the negative two. Next, this one has one, two, three, four. You want to say this one is, but it isn't because it doesn't have a decimal. This has only four sig figs, so in scientific notation, it better only have four numbers written. So 1.452 times 10 to the 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. We just make sure we don't include that 0. Here we have a decimal place telling us this 0. We know it, and that means we got five sig figs, and this would be 1.4520 times 10 to the 4. All right, so now we get into rules for multiplication and division. And how we use significant figures, we use them when we're doing calculations. Um, and so in these rules, let's say you go out to your yard and you find a random rock. And obviously your first question about this random rocks it, rock is, what's its density, right? Because that's what everybody wants to know. And this rock looks kind of funky, like that. And kind of like an elephant. Give it your, oh, now, no, just kidding. It's a dog, it's totally a dog rock. Okay, let's color it in so we don't get distracted, like me. So we've got this rock and we want to know its density. Well, density, is the amount of mass per volume something has. Um, we're not going to get too much into it, but generally speaking, it's written in grams per centimeter cubed or grams per milliliter. Centimeter cubed is the same as a milliliter because a one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter cube is equal to a milliliter. So if you fill that one by one by one centimeter with water, for example, that would be a milliliter of water. All right, so we want to figure out the number of grams per centimeter cubed or grams per milliliter this thing has. We can't just take a measuring tape and measure length times width times height because it's not uniform. So what we can do is we can place it in water because water will displace by the volume that something is. So when you hop in a bathtub, the water goes up because by the exact, it goes up, it's displaced by the exact volume that you are. So let's go ahead and take this rock and we place it in water, and we'll get there, but can we keep the same shape? So let's say it started off at 20.1 and ended up at 24.1, which is a difference of 4.0 milliliters. So we put it in water, the volume of the water went up by 4.0 milliliters. All right, so we know how many milliliters it is, so we know that density equals grams per milliliter. So we've got grams per 4.0 milliliters. Now all we need to do is figure out the grams. Well, you throw it on your kitchen scale, let's say, and you set your setting to grams, and the kitchen scale says it's 16.2 grams. All right, so that's cool. You can figure out its density. You know it's 16.2. Divide, grams divided by 4.0 milliliters. Let's go ahead and calculate that and make sure we got it all right. Looks to me 4.5, 16.2 divided by 4, 4.5 grams per milliliter. And that would be the density of this object. All right, so that's cool. But what if you're not happy with that and you decide, hey, I can do better. So you send it off for some really, really awesome calculations. You send it to NASA and you're like, hey, y'all, can you please measure the mass of this rock? So they put it on their scale and they're like, yeah, no problem. The mass of this rock is 16.201654 grams. And you're like, mind blown. Okay, we can do this. We can calculate the NASA density. The NASA density would be 
um, 16.201654 grams divided by 4.0 liters. And that would be, let's go ahead and do it, 16.201654 divided by 4.0, and I get 4.050415 grams per milliliter. Whoa. All right, so which one do you trust more, this one or this one? I'm gonna go ahead and erase this so I can use all this space here. Well, the answer lies in significant figures, and that's pretty much why we've learned them. So we can tell how accurate something is or, or exactly how much information we know about a particular measurement, even when we calculate with numbers. So here are the rules with multiplication and division. Your answer? Your answer should have the same sig figs or significant figures as the measurement with least sig figs in calculation. So your answer should have the same number of sig figs as the answer with the least number of sig figs in your calculation. Well, let's go back to our two calculations. We did this one, and we did this one. In this particular calculation, we had a number of a measurement of 16.2 grams that has three sig figs. Here, we have 4.0 that only has two sig figs. My answer can only have as many sig figs as the one that has the least. What's got the least, two or three? two. So my answer can only have two sig figs. So what I do, because I have a five, I'm going to end up rounding. So this would be actually round up because 0.5 we're going to round up would be 4.1 grams per milliliter. Now we look at this one, same thing. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sig figs in this number. This number only has Two. And sorry, I wrote liters instead of milliliters. I'm sorry. How annoying. Here we have eight. Here we have two. So therefore, two is our least. Our answer can only have two. What I do is I underline the first two and I ask if the number next to it is five or greater. If it's five or greater, I round up. In this case, it's five or greater. I'm going to round up 4.1 grams per milliliter. Did it matter? Did it matter if we sent it to NASA or not? No, because our value can only have the same number of sig figs as your one of the least amount of sig figs in the calculation. So no matter which way you did it, the answer ended up being 4.1 grams per milliliter. Let's look at addition and subtraction. In fact, probably need a little more paper for this. So in addition and subtraction, it's a little bit different. In addition and subtraction, we look at precision. not sig figs. Let me give you an idea of what that means. If I have a number 40, let's say I make it 400.000. This is the hundreds place. This is the tens. This is the ones. This is my tenths place. This is my hundredths place, and this is my thousandths place. The further you go to the right, the more precise it is. So as we know more and more information about it, we know more and more about the precision of the measurement. This is different than talking about precision versus accuracy. All right, this is talking about details. So. Hundreds, tens, ones, tenths, hundreds, thousands. Great. Let's use this. So if I have a number, for example, that's 527.1, and I add 
3.002, you would normally go about adding it like this. Well, there's a 2, a 0, a 1. The 7 plus a 3 gives you 10. You carry the 1. You got a 3 and a 5. Or you might have done it any which way that you wanted. Um, maybe even added a 3 first because common core and whatever, whatever way it works for you. Awesome. So we end up getting this answer. However, much like significant figures, when we add and subtract, our answer can only have the least amount of precision as the least, uh, can only have as much precision as the least precise number in your calculation. So let me write that down. Your answer can have, let me make it must have, same precision as least precise number in your calculation. All right, so what I do is going from left to right, I look to see which one's the least precise. Well, here I knew it to the hundreds, tens, ones, tenths place. And here I knew it all the way down to the thousandths place. Tenths, thousandths. Which one's the least precise? This one, the one that we only knew one decimal point over to the tenths place. Therefore, my answer can only go to the tenths place. So when I go to circle my answer first, I like to kind of circle it, and then I ask if the number next to it is five or greater. Is it five or greater? Nah. So we can just get rid of it. My answer would be 530. Point one. If I wanted to put that in scientific notation, I could. That would be 5.301 times 10 to the 2. Now, I've got some example problems to go over to kind of make sure we really understand these. In case you can't tell, I, I kind of calculate everything with y'all because I expect you to have a calculator out and be doing this with me, much like you would be doing in a classroom situation. Okay, so I make a note here because this is something that I'll be doing. I'll be following through with it. When I multiply and divide, as soon as I get my answer, I put it in scientific notation and then I figure out the sig figs. When I add and subtract, I actually get the answer already, figure out the precision, and then put it in scientific notation. So you'll see some examples of that. All right, let's start with question number one. I have 42.36 times 1.2. Well, here I multiplied and divided, so I'm looking at sig figs. When I do that, I get an answer of 50.832, which I would want to put first, first into scientific notation. 5.0832 times 10 to the 1. Now I can look at the number of significant figures it should have. This one has four, this one has three. What's smaller? Three. One answer can only have three. I underlined up to the third place. One, two, three. I ask if the number next to this is a five or greater. It is not, so I can essentially truncate it, and my answer is 5.08 times 10 to the one. All right, let's go ahead and look at the adding and subtracting. What I'd like to do is actually line up the decimal places it makes it easier for me. Here we're subtracting though. So when we add and subtract, what do we look at? Precision or sig figs? Here we gotta look at precision. In other words, which one do we know the least about? Well, we know this first one to the hundredths place and this one to the tenths place, telling us our answer can only go to the tenths place. First, let's figure our answer out. Um, 1.37 minus 1.2. Or give me, or excuse me, 1.57 minus 1.2 would give me 0.37. And again, we're looking at precision. We knew this one to the hundredths place. We knew this one to the tenths place. My answer can only go to the tenths place. So I underline that up to the tenths place. 
then don't forget about rounding. You ask if this number is a five or greater. It is, so we actually have to round up. 0.37 would round to 0 0.4. That is my answer. My answer in scientific notation would be four times 10 to the negative one. And I should have boxed this one up here. Sorry. All right. So hopefully that's making some sense. If it's not, the next few hopefully will make it um, make a lot better sense. Here we have 1500 times 2.0. First, we wanna go ahead and multiply them out. That gives me an answer of 3000. Then you wanna put that number in scientific notation. That would be 3.000 times 10 to the third. That is not my answer though. Once it's in scientific notation, then I figure out sig figs. This one has two. This one also has two. That was poorly done. So my number can only have two. My answer is 3.0 times 10 to the third. And this is why it's important to put it in scientific notation first. If you didn't, you would have been kind of confused because you'd been like, I don't know how to write 3,000 with two sig figs. Or maybe you did because you were paying attention to the problem with the 4,000 that we did. All right, this is everybody's favorite one because it seems to be very frustrating, but it's a really important concept. If you have $1,500 in your bank account and you take $2 out, how much do, how much do you have? You probably still have about 1500 bucks in your bank account. Because when I say you got 1500 bucks in your bank account, you probably don't have exactly $1,500.00. You probably have a rough estimate around there, right? And so when we look at 1500 and we subtract two, we gotta look at the least precise number. Because again, we're looking at adding, subtracting. This is precision. This one up here again, was sig figs. So pay attention to whether you're adding, subtracting, or multiplying and dividing. They have very different rules. So here we're looking at precision. Now you can subtract this and you get 1498.0. But again, precision. So which one do you know the least? Or which one, yeah, which one do you know the least amount? This one you know the thousands, the hundreds place. Do you know the tens place? You actually don't. Why? Because you only knew these two because this thing only had two sig figs, right? Remember, zeros after numbers, if there's no decimal, you don't know them. So this could have been 1,525, it could have been 1,490, you don't know. So if you got 1,525 and you subtract two or 1,490 and you subtract two, those are very different answers that you'll get. So in not knowing those two, we have to take that into account. So, we only knew up to the hundreds place telling us our answer. We only know up to the hundreds place. Here we knew to the tenths place. So this was by far more precise than this one. So we only knew this and this. If we have 14 and then a 9 to 8, what does that round up to? That should round up to 15. And that's why our answer ends up being 1500. In scientific notation, that would be 1.5 times 10 to the three, because again, we only knew two of those. Now your book has a question that seems to bother people a lot, so I'm just gonna do it right now. Let's say you have 200, and you subtract 18. Well, here we knew to the hundreds place, here you knew to the ones, which do you know the least about? The hundreds, right? And so, when you take this, yes, you get an answer of, whoop, sorry, yes, you get an answer of 182. However, you only know to the hundreds place. So you look at the hundreds place, you look at this number as a five or greater, it is, so you gotta round it up. This ends up giving you 200. Now, if I were to take and do this with 100 and subtract 18, I get an answer of 82. But again, you only know to the hundreds place. This is the tens, this is the twos. What, if we don't know this one, but we got an eight, what does 0.8 round to? It would round to a one. So that's why this ends up being 
100. So make sure you really understand this. If you don't, go back through and watch this again. Sorry, this should be a subtraction. If you don't, go back through and watch the whole thing again. I guarantee you a question like this is going to show up on an exam. I gave you guys some decent examples because here's one more issue. We got 1,500 and we're subtracting 5. 1,500 minus 5, we have 1,495. Ah, but what place do we know it to? This we know to the hundreds and this we know to the ones. We know the least about the one that's on the furthest to the left, the hundreds. Therefore, our answer should round to the hundreds. You underline that, ask if the number next to it is five or greater. It is, so we round up. Our answer would be 15. Fill in the rest with zeros to make sure you get the same amount of places. 1,500, which would be 1 1.5 times 10 to the third. Okay, everybody's favorite part. Let's go ahead and blend it all together. I highly suggest if you've followed through this lecture the whole time, then now you take a break and you let it settle in and you relax and you come back this to this another day. All right, so here we have a situation where we have several different steps. Well, we wanna follow PEMDAS, um, pretty much the T and keep track of sig figs or precision along the way. So the first thing we would do in this calculation, if we were putting in our calculator, would be the multiplication anyway. So let's make sure we do the multiplication. Oop. Sorry. So we got 47.20. 47.2 times 18.0. This right here gives me an answer of 849.6. Eight hundred forty-nine point six. Now I want to keep track every time I do a calculation. Ask yourself how many sig figs or what the precision should be, and make sure you keep track of that. Here, I had four sig figs. Here, I had three. This answer should have three, telling me I know the eight, the four, and the nine. I don't know the point six, but you use it anyways. Don't know it. but use it. It's our best guess and it does actually come into play. Um, if you get rid of it, you're going to underestimate the value of this number. Okay, to this, we're going to add 1.4673. So, this gives me an answer of 800 51.0673. All right, so that's cool. What do we know? Well, remember that now we added. So now we're looking at precision. Before we use sig figs to figure out this one, now we're adding. So when we go to add it, we say which is the least precise number. Well, this one we only know to the ones place because that's what our sig figs up here told us. So this we only know to the ones place. This one we know all the way to the ten thousandths place or whatever. And so in answering this, we can only accurately say we know the number to the ones place there. It has nothing to do with sig figs. It has to do with precision. There's no one-stop shop. You couldn't have looked at this number and known the answer. You have to take your time and go through each one and figure out the answer. And here I get an answer of 851. In other words, 8.51 times 10 to the two. All right, let's go ahead and just move the parentheses over to completely change the calculation. Here we have 18.0 plus 1.4673, that's the one we'd want to do the first. So if we do that, we get an answer of 18, or excuse me, ah, 19, I can do it, 0.4673. But we add it, so we look at what? Precision. So and we have to calculate precision into this. This we knew to the tenths place, 
This one we knew way further. So this is the one that we're going to look at. We know to the tenths place. And therefore, when I do my underline, I'm underlining to the tenths place. Now we take that number and multiply it by 47.20. The whole number, not just part of it, the entire number. If you get really good at this, you'll figure out you can use two past the number, but that's it. And I get an answer of 401703. Point seven seven, I think. One, two, four. No, I'm just kidding. The three goes right there. I've got a weird setting on my calculator right now. So I get an answer of 40,170.377. Let me rewrite that again. 40,170.377. Okay, now we multiplied though. And when you multiply, what do you look at? Sig figs or precision? There we look at sig figs. So this one, when we underlined to the tenths place, we also signified that this only has three sig figs. Yes, we use those numbers, but this only has three sig figs. Now we're multiplying it by something that had four sig figs. What's smaller, three or four? Three. When you multiply again, you wanna put your number in scientific notation first. So this would be 4.0170377. Times 10 to the 4. And again, I wanted to have three sig figs, so I underlined the first three. Ask if the number next to that underline is 5 or greater. It is. So I round up 4.02 times 10 to the 4. And that would be my answer. If you want some additional help, I'll post some additional videos that specifically go over just multiplication and division just addition and subtraction, and just putting them together in different ways. Um, but yeah, that's the end of the lecture for now, and y'all should have another one coming up next week. Take care.